Thank you very much for this invitation. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to um, talk to you about a new line of research in um, our group. Um, and with this, in this research, we're interested in understanding the impact of lesions and recovery on the modularity structure of functional neural networks. And the work that I'm going to talk about today uh, is, was carried out by a postdoc in my lab, Yuan Tao, and it's carried out, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> under the auspices of the Center for the Neurobiology of Language Recovery, which is an NIDCD uh, funded P50 that um, involves my lab and is headed by Cindy Thompson at Northwestern and her group, and Todd Parrish's group at Northwestern also, Swathi Karan at Boston University and David Kaplan at Harvard and MGM. Um, the other members of the team here um, in my lab are a number of postdocs, um, lab manager, um, uh, speech language pathologists, and graduate students who are um, here shown for you. So what I want to start with is I want to start with um, explain, uh, giving you an example of what it is that we're trying to understand. Um, and so what we have here is we have an individual who suffered a stroke, um, who has a lesion. And what I want to show you in this video is I want to show you uh, the improvement in his spelling performance across a three month period of, of rehabilitation. And so what the video shows is his attempts to spell the word emperor. And what you'll see is that on each training session, um, he's asked to spell a set of words. So this is the word emperor and he's asked to spell the word and that's followed by some training on the word and then in another session again he's asked to spell the word followed by training i'm not going to be showing you the training part i'm just going to be showing you the spelling attempts at different training sessions across the three month period so that you can see uh his improvement emperor emperor It's a little hard to see what he's writing, so we're showing you the letters that he's producing. Uh, we're, we're printing up them up there on the screen for you. I'm assuming you can see those. And now on another uh, training session. another session. So he's received now several weeks of training, at least a couple of weeks of training. Okay, pretty close now. And finally, we have success. Okay, so the question that we're interested in is what happened in his brain over the course of this period where he uh, improved um, in his spelling performance? And um, just to give you a little a brief background on spelling in the brain, again, this the, the work I'm going to be telling you about um, focuses on dysgraphia and recovery from acquired dysgraphia. Um, so um, th what this image here shows you is the results of a meta-analysis of functional neuroimaging studies with healthy um, individuals that show the areas of the brain that are most typically recruited for spelling. So individuals are in the scanner, they're doing spelling tasks, and across a number of studies, these are the brain areas that are typically involved in spelling in the healthy brain. Now in our group of individuals, this is the overlay of their lesions. So you can see that um, the highest density of lesions overlaps with some of these areas of the spelling network. So not surprisingly, 
they have spelling deficits, but we also see recovery. So the question is, what is it that's happening in the brain uh, that supports this recovery of function? And we, um, we, there are a number of different ways that one could go about um, trying to gain some insight into this issue. And um, certainly one approach, the most widely used approach to date is to have somebody, uh, they do a spelling task, let's say in the scanner before treatment, put, do some treatment, have them go into the scanner again, do a spelling task after treatment, and then identify which of the brain areas in which activation has changed from before treatment to after treatment. So this would be localizing brain areas that show recovery related pre post changes in the magnitude of the brain activity in those areas. And this type of analysis um, is, of course, very useful, provides a number of insights, but we're going to use a different approach, um, or I'm going to talk to, we've done this approach also, but we're going to talk to, I'm going to talk to you about a different approach. Okay. And then this approach, what we're going to do is we're going to be interested in looking at um, not so much the magnitude of changes in specific brain areas, but the changes in the connectivity properties between brain areas. So we can think of the brain as a network of different uh, brain areas that are connected, um, and they are connected structurally, of course, via white matter, but that won't be what we're studying. Instead, we're going to be studying what is referred to as functional connectivity, which is not the physical connectivity between brain areas, but it's the synchronicity or the coordination of activity between brain areas. So one can think of two brain areas as being more or less strongly connected depending on whether the activity between those brain areas um, is more or less synchronous or more or less similar. And so the brain activity that one can analyze can come from resting state fMRI and to date most of the studies that have been done on this issue have come from resting state fMRI, but we'll be using task-based fMRI um, in this study. So we'll be looking at the functional connectivity or the similarity in brain response between pairs of brain areas um, while participants derive from data that, that was collected while participants were doing a task um, in the scanner. Um, and so, yeah, and so this figure here is just essentially showing what it is that we are going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the response, the brain response of one brain area during a task and the response of another brain area, and we're going to be correlating them and seeing how similar those brain responses are where high correlations are, uh, represent high connectivity and lower correlations essentially uh, correspond to low connectivity between brain areas. So there are, there are a number of different ways of evaluating the network properties of the brain, the, these connectivity relationships between brain areas, and these are just a list of some of the different ways that people have used or some of the different characteristics of networks that people have analyzed, and this is a, a commonly used uh, analytic toolbox. Um, that is used to evaluate these properties. We're going to be focusing on the notion of modularity and we're going to be interested in, in evaluating the changes in, in the modular organization of the uh, functional brain network. So um, as everybody um, is probably well aware, if you consider a network composed of elements or nodes, um, the connections between elements um, in a brain network are not homogeneous. So some connections are stronger than others and as a result, these dishomogeneities and connectivity create clusters or subnetworks or what are sometimes called modules. And so the, the human brain has a modular organization with um, some nodes having stronger uh, connectivity amongst them than they have. So these have stronger connectivity between them and these also, these nodes have stronger connectivity between themselves, but they have weaker connectivity across these modules. So dense connections among, among nodes within uh, a group you know, is the is the hallmark of 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 a mod of a modular of a module or modular structure, um, and and the the uh, a network can have different degrees of modularity or different degrees to which these dishomogeneities are created, and the forces that drive or sculpt the network um, into its modular structure are the forces of integration and segregation, which can operate at global levels or local levels. And just to um, make this, just to clarify this and illustrate this, uh, if we consider these nodes here, um, they're pretty homogeneously connected with one another. We could say that there's high global integration, that there's connectivity across the nodes in this network, and there's relatively little low segregation. So there aren't uh, nodes that are clustering together, segregating off from other nodes. So the nodes are highly interconnected. This is high global integration. And as a result of this high global integration, there's low modular organization. 
But if we were, there's a couple of different, there's two main ways and there's two ways in which we can increase modularity here. One is by decreasing global integration. So if we remove some of the connectivity across these nodes, we also increase modularity. We're now creating uh, these, these modules. We're increasing um, segregation. Another way to increase modularity is actually to increase integration at the local level. So if we increase integration at the local level by adding connections here, here we're also increasing the modularity of the system. So it's important to keep in mind these various ways in which modularity can be affected at um, a global level. So by decreasing global integration, we actually increase modularity and by increasing local integration, we also can increase modularity and we'll be revisiting um, these concepts. Um, so this is, so modularity refers, is a characteristic of the network as a whole, um, and it emerges from the relationship between nodes, and nodes themselves can play different roles um, in, in a network. Um, so nodes that have many connections to other nodes are called hubs, um, and global hubs, what we'll call global hubs, are um, nodes that um, have well, high cross I'm hearing something. Okay, maybe, maybe that's okay. Okay, so um, global hubs are nodes that um, are in, like this is a global hub that is involved in cross module communication and global hubs that allow communication across the modules, allow coordination across modules for complex tasks. They also allow for recruitment of new configurations of modules to solve novel tasks. So these would be global hubs in this little network. Uh, local hubs, for example, um, are nodes such as these, um, where which have um, more within module connectivity. So this node has connections to the other nodes in its module, and this node also has connection to other nodes in its module. Um, and so creating um, a high degree of within module connectivity allows for specialization of function, allows for functions to become more automatized. If there's damage to the system, damage will be more um, contained in a system where you have a highly modular structure. And what you can see here is that some nodes could be global hubs connecting across modules, and they can also be local hubs um, also connecting within modules. And other nodes might just be local hubs, and other nodes might be just primarily global hubs. So in the work that I'm going to describe today, we're going to be concerned with three of this assortment of measures that we could be um, evaluating networks with. We're going to be concerned with three graph theoretic measures, modularity, PC, and WD. Um, and modularity, um, the modularity is a, is a term that applies to a particular, modularity in italics is a term that applies to a particular measure, which is Newman's Q. And I'm not going to go through the formula, but the thing to understand about this modularity measure is that it's a single value that quantifies the degree of modularity of an entire network. So one would, could get a Newman's Q for this entire network or for the entire brain. And what Newman's Q does is it, um, it assumes a reference modular structure, and then it quantifies the extent to which the connections in your sample structure, the structure that you're going to evaluate, the network that you're going to evaluate, the extent to which the connections in your sample network um, uh, occur, with the, the extent to which those connections occur within the reference modules, the modules that are in your reference, ne uh, reference uh, network, more than you would expect by chance. Okay, so given that uh, the nodes have some number of connections, what is the extent to which the connections of nodes are occurring within modules um, as opposed to just occurring um, randomly between nodes? So this is what Newman's Q is going to quantify. Now, Newman's Q or modularity is based on these two factors, okay, as I've described conceptually before. It's, uh, it arises out of the connectivity that there is between modules and the connectivity that there is within modules, and we're going to measure each of these. So the participation coefficient, which is called PC, um, quantifies for each node how much a node connects across modules, okay? So a node that has high PC is a node that has connections with multiple modules, um, and we're going to call nodes with high PC values global hubs. Uh, the other measure that we'll be looking at is WD, or within module degree Z-score, and this quantifies how much a given node is connected within its own module, how many connections it has with other nodes that are within its modules. And remember, this is all um, uh, in the context of a reference 
uh, modular structure. Okay, so for every node, we can measure its PC value and its WD value. And for the network as a whole, we can measure um, its modularity value. We can also, for the network as a whole, get an average PC value. So these are the values on average of all the global hubs, uh, the PC values of the global hubs. And we can also get an average WT, WD value, which is the average WD value of the local hubs um, in the network. Right. So uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, if we have the here, we have two networks that have the same number of nodes, the same number of connections. Uh, network one has higher overall modularity than network two. And that's because relative to the reference network, which is, which you can see here sort of within the gray um, background, the grouping of nodes into the reference uh, network, you can see that more of the connections are within the modules in this network than they are in this network. This network, on the other hand, has more across module connections. And these across module connections are decreasing the overall modularity of the network. The modularity is the degree of segregation into modules. You can also see here, for example, in terms of PC and WD values, that this individual node has a high PC, sorry, let's look at this one. This individual node has a high PC value because it's connected to th three different modules within the network, whereas this node here has a low PC value participation coefficient. It's not a good global hub because it only connects with one um, no, one other module. Um, and you can also see that these nodes differ in terms of their WD. So this has a high WD value because it connects to many nodes within its module. And this again has a low WD. It's only connecting with uh, one node within its module. Okay, so what we're, what we're interested in understanding are the effects of lesions on network properties. Excuse me. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, previous work that's been done on this. Um, so um, simulate, simulation work, there are a couple of studies that have done uh, simulated lesions and evaluated the effects of simulated lesions, but very few studies re really have looked at the effect of actual lesion on network properties. Um, and so there's a study by Grattan et al. who um, examined a number of cases of individuals with chronic focal lesions. And what they found was that overall there's lower modularity. Um, in the lesion versus the healthy um, controls, and they found this in both hemispheres. And they also found that modularity values were correlated with the extent of global hub damage. So the global hub damage, the amount of damage to these global hubs um, had uh, an impact on modularity, as you might expect, and as the simulation work has shown. Interestingly, they do not find that lesion size had an effect on modularity, and we'll see that we also don't find that. In terms of the effects of recovery on modularity, there have been a few studies. Um, Siegel et al. looked at individuals with stroke and they measured um, modularity values at two weeks, three months, and one year after stroke. And what they found that at the acute stage, modularity was below normal, but that modularity values normalized by three months. Arneman et al. found that um, higher pretreatment modularity, and remember higher modularity means more segregation into local networks, predicts better response to treatment in the TBI group. Uh, Duncan and Small and also Siegel et al. found that better recovery is associated with larger increases in modularity. So modularity becomes greater, more segregation is over time is associated with better recovery. Okay, so it's summarized, these are, and these are really pretty much the, the, the extent of previous studies that have examined these properties. Um, so to summarize that in terms of modularity, uh, what people have found is that at pretreatment, higher modularity seems to be associated with healthier neural systems, closer to normal, better able to respond to treatment, and that recovery is associated with uh, increasing modularity. And I just want to do a note of caution since higher modularity seems to, you know, be suggesting that it's a good thing, which it may be, but just it's, the picture is probably not that simple. Um, in work with neurotypical adults, um, what um, UA and all found, and it seems really sensible that the picture should be more complicated, is that high modularity is associated with strong performance on less complex tasks, whereas low modularity was associated with strong performance on Sorry, it was uh, high modularity was associated with performance on less complex tasks, on simpler tasks, and low modularity with strong performance on more complex tasks. And I'm just putting, pointing this out here just to, to show that um, it, 
that it may not be the case that there's a simple story about high modularity is good and, and low modularity is bad, that not surprisingly, this may be um, modulated by the demands um, on the system. So in the study that I'm going to be telling you about, we looked at individuals with um, dysgraphia as a result of stroke. We have 15 individuals, a, six, a single left hemisphere stroke. They are a relatively highly educated group. And we also had two age match uh, groups of neurotypical controls. Um, in terms of the, stu the structure of the study, uh, individuals came in and had comprehensive, comprehensive language and cognitive assessments. They, had they underwent two neuroimaging sessions. There was a behavioral intervention for about 12 weeks. Then we repeated the language and cognitive assessments and the neuroimaging sessions. And then we had a follow-up that was just a, a, a language assessment after 12 weeks. And this took the whole, the, the period of the study for most individuals was about 10 months. Um, so um, some of the features that are different or specific to this study is that we're looking at whole brain connectivity properties. There's a, a number of studies that do look at changes in connectivity properties, um, but most of the uh, studies that have done this are looking at changes in connectivity properties of particular networks that they're interested in or particular brain regions, whereas this approach with the graph theoretic measures is more typically in what we're doing is a whole brain network connectivity approach. We're using task-based um, fMRI data rather than resting state fMRI data, and we may be the first to do that in this population. We're also looking at multiple measures within the same study, modularity, PC, and WD. We have multiple time points, pre-treatment, um, sorry, and post-treatment that should be. We have comparisons with controls. And again, we're looking at acquired, acquired dysgraphia, which has not been looked at before. So we have our, we're, we're interested in understanding how the brain changes as a result of uh, recovery. Presumably the treatment is going to induce some recovery. Um, in our dysgraphia treatment, um, we have individually tailored stimulus lists. So each individual has a list of 40 training items and these items were selected such that before treatment letter accuracy was between 25 to 80% on each word um, on two successive administrations. And this is an attempt to put people at, to have them be working in a relatively you know, similar range of difficulty. Um, the approach that we use is a spell study spell approach um, that's similar to what Beeson has used in a number of studies and we've used before. And um, this approach targets the central components of the spelling process. So although individuals are actually writing words during the training, we're not targeting the motor aspects of writing, we're targeting the central components which have to do with the storage and retrieval of the spellings of words and, the, and, and um, identifying the constituent letters um, in memory of the spellings of words. Um, participants engaged in usually two uh, sessions per week. They lasted between an hour and an hour and a half for approximately 12 weeks. They were trained to criteria, 90% uh, accuracy on two administrations or no improvement after six administrations. And the average number of sessions was 26. So let me uh, show you this video so that you can have a sense of what happens in a single training trial. Okay, so the training trial is going to start with asking the individual to spell a word, which is the piece of the training trial that you saw in the earlier video. But now I'm going to show you what happens for the full for a full training trial on one word. Paint, paint. First time no. you're seeing it. No. First time. Mm -hmm. Are you done? Or you want to? Yes. Okay. But it's not quite right. Okay. It's not quite right. right. Mm -hmm. You're right. It's not quite right. The very first time we're seeing it. Okay. We're going to see it several times uh -huh. today. See, you have the P. Yes. And then these are reversed. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you have the N tucked yeah. in there. Uh huh. And then you have Paint. Paint. And cane. 
Okay, so that's what we do in our training trials. And what you can see here is the improvement of our participants um, from pretreatment to post-treatment. And you can see the maintenance um, for follow-up. All individuals significantly improved from pre to post-treatment and their performance at follow-up was also significantly higher than at pretreatment. Um, also, the other thing that we I wanted to know is whether the improvements we're seeing are selective to spelling. Um, and so what you can see here is that indeed they are because their pre and post treatment performance on a range of other language tasks is stable. Um, and so what this allows us to have is a little more confidence that the neural, the neural changes that we're seeing are uh, related to the spelling changes and not to other uh, language changes that you know, potentially could have taken place. So we uh, did fMRI scanning with these individuals to collect our data about uh, brain activity. Uh, they did a spelling task during the scanner where they um, saw their, that involved their training words. They had two pre-treatment and two post-treatment scanning sessions. In each scanning session, there were two runs of the spelling task. So at each time point, uh, you have four runs of the spelling task. The control participants have a one time four runs of the spelling task. And so the questions that we we're interested in addressing were, uh, can be divided into questions about pretreatment, the state of the networks at pretreatment, and the changes in the network with recovery. So for pretreatment, we want to know how do lesions impact the network properties compared to controls, these three network properties that we're interested in. Do pretreatment network properties index deficit severity? So does the state of the network before treatment index the severity of the deficit? And are there uh, pretreatment network properties that are associated with future recovery? In terms of recovery, we want to know whether network properties change from pre to post treatment, how these network property changes are distributed across the brain, and are the changes associated with behavioral changes? So we need to analyze um, the data that we collect from the fMRI task in order to address these questions. And so we have five steps in the data analysis. So the first step is to generate task-based functional connectivity matrices, okay? So there are, you know, tens of thousands of voxels in the brain that we're recording data from. We are not going to look at the connectivity between every possible pair of voxels. So instead, to reduce the number of nodes that we're going to be considering, we use 235 nodes that are taken from power at all. Uh, this depicts those 235 nodes, and we're going to compute the connectivity between every pair of these nodes. And the connectivity that we're computing is based is the connectivity or the time course of the residual of the GLM uh, time course um, from the task. And I'm happy to talk some more about uh, that particular um, connectivity measure. But needless to say, it's a measure of the time course of activity um, that's associated with performing the task. So for every pair of these nodes, we compute the correlation of the residual time series, um, and we generate a um, correlation matrix that um, reports those values. So every point in this matrix, um, so these are the 235 nodes, and 235 nodes, so every point in this matrix is a correlation value that's been color coded to indicate the intensity of the relationship between those two, or the similarity of the relationship and activation between this pair of, of nodes. The second step is to identify a reference modular structure. Remember I said that these measures of modularity in PC and WD require a reference structure for their computation. So for this, we take the average um, uh, matrix of all the control subjects in control group one. We subject that to hierarchical clustering that's looking to identify how these 
um, nodes in terms of their connectivity or grouping, the grouping of the nodes. And from that hierarchical clustering analysis, we identify 10 bilateral clusters. Okay, we identify 10 clusters, and it turns out that they are uh, bilateral clusters. Um, and again, we can talk some more about that if people are interested. The third step, so this now, sorry, this now serves as our reference modular structure. So this is what we're going to take to be the reference modular structure. Um, and we can use that reference modular structure to identify reference hubs, um, global hubs, and local hubs. So we consider all of these nodes. For every node, we calculate its PC value, the extent to which it um, has strong connectivity with other modules. Um, in this reference network, and we and we compute its WD value, the strength of its connectivity within um, its own uh, module. And so we identify for this reference network as global nodes, the nodes with the highest PC values, and these are depicted here. And we identify the set of local hubs, and these are the nodes with the highest WD values. So now we have a reference network, we have reference global hubs, and we have reference local hubs. So now on the fourth step, we can take for each individual now, we can take their individual um, correlation matrix. If it's a patient, we delete the um, connections that involve nodes that are damaged. We discard the lesion connections. And then that's what that's here. And then we take the remaining values and we simply binarize them. We have a threshold and connectivity values above a threshold um, will consider to, to be uh, connections and those below a threshold will consider to be not connections. And so now we have for each individual, we have um, their uh, connectivity matrix. And now we can use this connectivity matrix um, and compute modularity PC and WD values for each individual with reference to these re the reference modular um, structure and PC and WD that we obtained from the control participants. So now that we have modularity PC and WD values for each individual in the patient group and in the um, control groups, we can carry out a number of statistical analyses to address those questions that we had. Um, before saying a little bit more about the analyses, let me just define a couple of terms. We um, are looking at one of the values that we're looking at that we're interested in is pretreatment severity, which we define by the score on the PALPA 40, which is a spelling to dictation task administered prior to treatment to all the participants in the study. And we also are going to be interested in spelling improvement, which will be the difference between pre and post treatment letter accuracy on the training items. Um, so we have those two. Uh, measures. And so we're going to carry out some analyses that involve comparing network properties either across time points or across groups. And these are being done with t-tests or pair t-tests. And then we have another set of analysis that will evaluate the relationship between the network measures and spelling performance, like pretreatment severity or spelling improvement. And these will um, involve linear regression models where the dependent measures are these network measures and the predictors are an, a set of predictors that we have listed here, okay? Um, including spelling severity, age, years of education, lesion volume, time after stroke, motion. For the models that are looking at change in network properties, we'll be looking at spelling improvement, accuracy of pretreatment, the number of pretreatment sessions, okay? So these are the regressors in these models. So let's get to the results. So for pretreatment, we had these three questions. How do lesions impact network properties? Do pretreatment network properties index deficit severity? And are pretreatment network properties associated with future recovery? Okay, just to remind you about the relationship between modularity and global integration and local integration, Remember that as global integration, connectivity across modules decreases, less connectivity across modules will get increases in overall network modularity. And also as local integration increases, integration within modules will also get increases in modularity. Okay, so what do we find? How do lesions impact network properties? What we find is that, what we have, sorry, uh, in each of these graphs, we have one for modularity, one for P average PC, what, for average WD, we have the lesioned results here for the pretreatment, and we have the two control groups here on each of the graphs, okay? And so uh, uh, what we can see is that there's no difference between the patients and the controls at pretreatment in terms of modularity and PC, but there is a significant difference between the patients and the controls in terms of their WD, the local uh, integration. So modularity and PC, the global connectivity are not different than controls. Um, consistent with what Siegel et al. found in terms of the chronic stage. But WD, this local connectivity is significantly lower than control. So the integration of the local networks is lower uh, than in controls. 
what about does pretreatment do pretreatment network properties index severity? So this is the performance on the top of 40 on the spelling test. Uh, and here we see that um, average PC, so this is the connectivity across modules, um, is significantly related to deficit severity in a way in the in the following way that higher connectivity across modules is associated with more severe deficit. So higher connectivity across modules means lower overall modularity, okay? So lower uh, overall modularity. So lower overall modularity um, is associated with higher um, connectivity across modules and both are associated with more severe deficits. So less modularity, um, lower modularity caused by higher global connectivity is associated with more severe deficits. And the third pretreatment question was, are pretreatment network properties associated with uh, future recovery? And what we see here is that there's a significant correlation between the WD, the local integration values before treatment and future response to treatment. So individuals that have higher modularity due to local, high local integration are going to respond better um, to treatment. And Similar to other studies, we find that lesion volume is not a predictor of response to treatment. So what is it that we find in terms of pretreatment? We find that, just to summarize what I just showed you, on average, modularity and PC or global connectivity are not significantly different from controls. But when you look within those modularity values, what you find is that the more severe deficits are associated with lower modularity within that set of modularity values, and that that lower modularity is due to higher global connectivity, more connectivity across uh, modules, creating more severe deficits and lower modularity. We also find that lower connect local connectivity is uh, significantly lower than controls, and when we look within those values of lower um, local connectivity, we find that there's better response to treatment among those individuals that have stronger um, local connectivity. So, individuals with higher modularity due to stronger local connectivity and or, lo or lower global connectivity have better functioning systems and are able to benefit more from treatment. So let's look at recovery. So we have three questions here. Um, let's look at the first. Do network properties change from pre to post treatment? So now we're looking at changes in network properties. And what, we've, what we have here then is the pre-treatment modularity, which we saw before, but now we have the post-treatment modularity and the control group modularity, okay? And what we find is that, in fact, overall network modularity increases from pre- to post-treatment, and WD also increases from pre- to post-treatment. So you find increasing amounts of local integration within modules, which is driving this overall increase in modularity um, across the brain uh, network. And in fact, just to point out, the modularity levels um, actually are higher after treatment are higher than they are in the control group. Um, and the WD values, although they increase significantly, remain significantly lower than in the control groups even after treatment. So now that we know that um, WD values um, significantly change um, from pre to post treatment, we can actually ask about WD because remember WD is a property of, of individual nodes. We can ask whether these WD changes are distributed in a uniform manner across the brain. So are all modules increasing in their local integration? Are there certain modules that are increasing more than others? So what we have here is we have for each of the 10 clusters or each of the 10 modules from the reference network, we have the pre and post, the two bars correspond for each, correspond to the pre and post WD values, okay? So the, the amount of local integration for each of these modules before treatment and after treatment. And you can see that there is a range of effects, some increases, some decreases, some staying the same, but statistically there's only one uh, brain area uh, in which um, the WD value, the local integration, change, significantly changes from pre to post treatment. And it's this area which is the ventral occipital temporal um, cluster. And if we look back at the, um, this is the result of the meta-analysis that's showing the um, brain areas that are involved in uh, spelling in the neurotypical brain. We can see that this region where we find the change in WD uh, is uh, occurring here in this ventral occipital temporal region that's normally recruited for spelling. So WD increases are not evenly distributed across the brain, and we're finding significant effects, at least only in ventral occipital temporal cortex.
And find, oh, so, sorry, this is, an, this is just a depiction of this change within VOTC. So if you, this is depicting the nodes that are in the VOTC cluster, the dots are the nodes in the cluster, and this is, what, this is the strength of the connectivity among the nodes in this ventral occipital temporal cluster among the hubs um, uh, in the control subjects. This is in the lesioned um, individuals prior to treatment. You can see that it's much sparser, and then you can see that after treatment, the connectivity within this cluster uh, increases and begins to approximate uh, the normal connectivity structure. And finally, the third question that we asked about recovery are, is, are changes in these network properties associated with behavioral changes? So are the changes in these properties in modularity, PC or WD, are they associated with changes in behavior? And what we find is that for modularity and for WD, there's a significant relationship between uh, network changes and behavioral changes. But you might have also noticed that the relationship is a negative one, okay? So what we have here actually is that larger modularity changes, so in, you know, increases in modularity are associated with, with um, sorry, yeah, increases in modularity are associated with smaller behavioral changes and increases in local connectivity, which are driving these uh, increases in modularity are associated with smaller behavioral changes. So overall, everybody is increasing their modularity and increasing their um, local connectivity, but those who change these the most are actually having uh, smaller behavioral benefits. So why is that, okay? Uh, and so one possibility would be that, well, maybe greater modularity is maladaptive, okay? So it is changing, but it's maladaptive. Now this would predict that higher modularity values after treatment should be associated with worse spelling performance. But we find that that's not the case, actually. So that doesn't seem to be an explanation. A uh, hypothesis that we are proposing is that, in fact, healthier systems require less neural change for greater benefit. Um, so if your system is healthier to begin with, you have higher modularity, higher local integration to begin with, small adjustments to that may produce large behavioral benefits. If you have a, a more damaged system, your system may be changing a lot, but it's going to require much more change to accomplish even more modest behavioral improvements. And this hypothesis predicts that we would expect to find that larger treatment effects, those who are improving the most, should actually have had less severe deficits at pretreatment, which we find, and that those who improve the most should have had higher modularity at pretreatment, which we also find. So let me just summarize what we found in terms of recovery. Modularity and local connectivity increase from pre to post treatment and they're related to one another. Uh, modul these modularity increases were driven by these, the increases in local connectivity, especially in ventral occipital temporal cortex. And we found this um, somewhat seemingly paradoxical effect, which we think we understand, which is that la larger modularity in W D uh, increases are associated with smaller behavioral increases. So putting all those various elements together, um, our overall summary is that at pretreatment, more modular networks with higher local integration, so they're more modular, there's more integration at the local level, are associated with lower deficit severity, healthier networks, and they are also, should these healthier networks are able to um, produce a larger behavioral response to treatment. In terms of recovery, we found that recovery is supported by increasing modularity, increasing the segregation in the system and the local integration of these networks, um, and for dysgraphia at least, especially in this intact ventral occipital temporal region. So those are the, that's what I wanted to uh, present in terms of the results. I know that I'm kind of right on the edge of time here. There are several discussion points. Um, if I think I can go through them in about um, five-ish minutes. I hope that that's okay. I can't hear you, so I'm just going to assume, or see you, so I'm assuming that this is going to be okay. Okay, so let me just touch on these, and we can always talk about them more uh, in discussion if people would like. So um, one question that we often get um, concerns the role of the hemispheres. So the reference clusters that were identified from the control um, data were actually all bilateral clusters. They didn't have to be. We didn't you know, force that solution. Um, that is what emerged um, from the analysis. And so what we did is we repeated all the analysis that I've shown you from pretreatment and recovery um, separately for um, nodes in the right hemisphere alone and in the left hemisphere alone. And the, there are only two results that were significant. Um, uh, one was that when we look at pretreatment, 
if you recall, um, for the whole brain analysis, modularity was not different at pretreatment for the patients compared to the controls overall. But when we look at the hemisphere separately, what we find is that in the left hemisphere, pretreatment modularity is significantly lower. So there's less modular structure. There's less local. Uh, there's less, you know, integration segregation into modules in the left hemisphere than for in the left for the patients in the versus the controls in the left hemisphere, but not in the right hemisphere. So that's one difference compared to the whole brain analysis. Also, uh, in terms of um, recovery, what we found in, when we looked at the um, the nodes within the ventral occipital temporal uh, cluster, and we separated them out between right hemisphere and left hemisphere, we found that there was an almost significant increase in the left hemisphere nodes in terms of their WD from pre to post treatment, whereas there was not even close to significant increase in the WD for the right hemisphere nodes. So more seems to be going on in the left hemisphere nodes in terms of change than in the right hemisphere nodes. So those two results do suggest some left lateralization of these effects, but I have to say that when we directly compare the results of the hemispheres to one another, they're not significantly different from one another. So I think we need to temper our um, uh, conclusions and excitement there. Why this particular brain area? Why the ventral occipital temporal cortex? Why are we seeing changes here? Well, as I pointed out, this is an area that um, is a critical area of the healthy spelling network. And it's also an area that's largely, that is entirely unlesioned in our uh, participant group. So this is a, a, a healthy tissue that is unlesioned. It's not the source of the spelling deficits for these individuals because it's unlesioned. And yet it's part of the normal spelling network. And it seems to be changing as a result of treatment. One of the things that we know about this part of the brain from studying um, healthy data from healthy neuroimaging, but also from studying lesions, is that this brain area here, the same brain area, this ventral occipital temporal area, um, uh, when it's lesioned, um, it's associated with lesions that affect the retrieval and storage of our knowledge of the spellings of words. So we store in long term, we know how to spell the word emperor because we stored in long term memory the letters that make up the spelling of emperor. And this brain region is involved in the storage and retrieval of that knowledge. So our hypothesis is that the treatment is strengthening the representation or retrieval processes um, um, and, have, and, and therefore in this area and played a key role in recovery. Um, what about the seemingly paradoxical result of smaller neural changes, larger behavioral gains? I think that it's really not paradoxical when you think about the health of the system and how a healthy system um, is uh, more likely to be responsive um, to, to change. Um, what this suggests is that the relationship between behavioral network changes are nonlinear, um, and we probably will need to um, adopt and develop nonlinear analysis approaches in order to look at these things more carefully, and those will require uh, larger data sets than, than we currently have. And finally, I just wanted to point out that recall that we're using task based functional connectivity, um, of, and so that has its own particular implications and predictions. Um, Fair and colleagues um, evaluated background connectivity this, that we use, this, this con the, the time course of the GLM residual. Um, and what they determined was that, um, that this, the residual time course reveals elements of a resting state network. So it has many characteristics in common with what you get from resting state functional connectivity, but it also combines with that elements of task-based um, performance. And so it is a, a, a meld, if you wish, of both resting state and task-based uh, networks. Um, and what this predicts is that um, we would expect to find different reference structures, different net reference networks and hubs according to the task that was used to uh, develop these, ref these um, reference networks and tasks. Um, since we're if, if we're using functional, this background connectivity measure, we would expect to get different networks and hubs depending on the task uh, that it's derived from. Um, and it Presumably, if we use resting state functional connectivity data, we would also get different uh, networks and hubs. And so it will be interesting as we move forward um, to look at these um, same individuals with their resting state data and see the extent to which resting state and task-based data yield similar or different insights into the effects of lesion and recovery. So uh, general conclusions, um, dysgraphia recovery seems to be supported by increased modularity driven by increased local integration within modules. Remember, increased modularity could be driven by 
a decrease in global connectivity or an increase in local connectivity, we're seeing it being driven in this case by an increase in the local integration within modules. Um, more, much more broadly, when we're assessing recovery now in this age of what we might call network neuroscience, we're interested in the global properties of networks. Uh, it's, these results suggest that not all change is highly global. We are assessing global properties, but these, this assessment has led us to identify changes in specific, specific, has allowed us to understand that changes in specific networks may be driving uh, recovery, um, perhaps more than changes in global properties. Although, of course, there are many other global properties that we haven't evaluated, which could turn out to be uh, important for understanding uh, recovery. But certainly not all change is highly global. And finally, um, there are some potential clinical applications. These measures may um, have a role to play in predicting a response to treatment, and um, we see them as potentially providing guidance um, for identifying targets, for example, for electrostimulation therapy, identifying brain areas that are supporting recovery of function. These might be turn out to be good areas to target um, with stimulation. And so let me just um, acknowledge our support from the National Institutes of Health, the NIDCD, and absolutely to our amazing, wonderful, and dedicated participants and their families. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Brennan. It was great. I'm gonna turn up our volume here as well. Okay, I'm assuming you can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Excellent. Um, so what we usually do is we will have questions from our room first, from our end, um, and then um, uh, uh, everybody online, attendance online, please uh, put your questions in the chat box and then I will read them out to Brenda. Any questions from our room? I had a question. So the the um, well, I, I have a few. <laughs> uh, one on the uh, on that negative correlation between uh, treatment uh, imp it, treatment improvement and the uh, and the modularity changes. One other thing I was thinking of is what if there is a um, have you taken into account the fact that if you're already high before you start, you have less opportunity for improvement? So people who are at 80%, they can only get so far. Uh, so that would mean that if you're lower at the beginning, you're going to have more improvement anyway, and that will give you the negative curve. Right. So we include um, pre-treatment accuracy in the regression analysis. So we're looking at values that have already taken into account the pre-treatment. Um, improvement. So we're looking at data scores that are that already have taken that into account. So I don't think that that's in a simple sense what it is. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Another question I had was whether uh, you mentioned that study that showed that there's actually a, it seems like a trade-off almost, right, in the types of uh, functions that do well with low modularity versus high modularity. Do you have a hypothesis or did you in fact see anything in your data that would suggest that there's another area where your patients seem to do worse after their modularity changes? Uh, we didn't find any areas where that occurred, you know, at a statistically significant level. Um, but I, you know, again, I do think that these are the the, the issues or the um, these are the questions that one should be attending to uh, moving forward. It could be that there just wasn't enough power to to find significant effects of that sort. Um, so I, I think that that is um, clearly something to keep an eye on out for. Okay. Any other questions from here? No. We have an online question from. Diana P, it says, um, you mentioned not focusing on motor aspect of spelling, but the process, though I do wonder whether some patients are having to use their non-dominant hand to spell, and if so, whether that may possibly influence whole brain modularity and the potential recruitment of increased connectivity between pairs of nodes and the greater left hemisphere involvement, or is this not very relevant? Oh, I wouldn't say it's not relevant. Um, so I, uh, one thing to, let me see. So one thing is to, to know, which I didn't talk about, which is what task are they doing in the scanner? So that's, you know, that would be when we're, that would be 
what we're collecting the brain activation data from. So in the scanner, they're doing a spelling task that doesn't require them to write. Um, so they're not actually writing in the scanner. So the brain data that we're analyzing doesn't involve the motor component of writing. And so I think that probably goes a long way to addressing that question, um, I hope, but you could have a follow-up on that. So the task that they're doing in the scanner, because now you're probably wondering, so what are they doing in the scanner if they're not actually writing this? Um, so uh, what they're doing in the scanner is, I actually have a slide, but I can just describe it to you. Um, so what they're doing in the scanner is they're lying in the scanner, they hear a word like emperor, um, and a letter appears on the screen, and they have to press a, a button with their non-dominant hand uh, whether or not that letter is in the spelling of the word they heard. So they have to um, go into, we would say they have to go into long-term memory, uh, retrieve the spelling of the word, and then uh, process it to identify the constituent letters of that spelling, and then respond whether or not the letter they just saw on the screen uh, uh, is one of the constituent letters of spelling uh, of, the, of the target word. And so that recruits the network the spelling network and we've done other studies with healthy controls where we use this task and we also have a writing in the scanner task um, to make sure that they you know that we're right that this task actually does recruit the same spelling network and so we find this extremely strong overlap between the networks for this the task that we use with the patients and the actual writing in the scanner task so i don't think that the any changes that there could be in terms of their you know, motor abilities, even though we weren't targeting them, they could have improved in their motor abilities over time. I don't think that those changes would be picked up, um, likely to be picked up with this task that we're using. Does that answer the question? If it doesn't, that can be a follow-up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, question from Dorian uh, Pustina. Great clear talk, thank you. I missed a couple of minutes, pardon if these answers were in the talk. Number one. Beside performance severity, do modularity and WD correlate also with lesion size? And the second question, since damaged nodes were excluded from graph models only from patients, could differences with controls be attributed only to this? Would excluding similar nodes from controls lead to similar observed anomalies? Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. So let me try, I'll try to remember both of them, but if I forget the second one, you might have to repeat it for me. Um, so, or I forgot the first one. <laughs> oh, it, it was uh, whether modularity and WD correlate. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. right, lesion size. Yeah, they're not correlated with lesion size, uh, neither one of them, which I think that may, maybe people find that surprising, um, but um, it's what other people have found also. And I think that um, if you think about really what's, um, happening is that you're taking a reference modular structure and you're taking an individual and you're you're um, comparing really the remaining nodes in that individual's uh, network and you're evaluating the modularity of those remaining nodes relative to those parts of the module of the reference modular structure um, and so if you realize that that's really what the modularity measure is doing, then maybe it's um, more understandable how lesion size um, is not uh, necessarily correlated with um, uh, modularity and WD. And then the second question had to do with whether we've done an analysis where we remove the same lesion nodes in our control participants, um, and do we find the same results that we find with the patient? So, um, is, is what's going on with the patients is simply the removal, the way we've been thinking about it, and you may have had something else in mind, but one way to think about it is, is the removal of these nodes, uh, is, is, are the changes in these network properties, can they be understood as simply removing these nodes, period, right, and nothing else happening? Um, and so you could test that by looking at the controls, removing those nodes, making these measurements. It would be like doing an acute lesion, looking at uh, control participants um, at the acute stage. It's as though you have your, you know, your brain activation, you have a lesion, you remove some nodes, and right at that moment, you look to see, um, you know, what are the results for these measures. Um, and uh, so this is work that we're just starting to do. And I can tell you that the real results are not the same. So when you, if you compare the lesion participants to controls, um, with intact nodes versus non-intact nodes, you do find some differences. 
Um, and so that's work that we're currently focusing on to try to understand what those differences are and what do they tell us about the reorganization that's taken place um, in the um, lesion cases. But I think that that really is a window into um, what's happening over the time course. These are chronic cases. If you, if you consider the control participants with just sort of this instant lesion to be kind of the acute moment, um, then you can consider the, 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 the comparison of the patients to the controls with these uh, simulated lesions to shed light on the changes that take place over the chronic period. So that's what we're looking at right now. So sort of halfway through your your answer, Dorian typed clear. Thank you. So oh, okay, you're good. <laughs> okay. <that's cool. laughs> I didn't need to do the other half. <laughs> I, I, did a, I did have a follow up, which is related, which is it, it's kind of similar. I was wondering to what extent the binarization that you do, where you discard nodes that don't meet a threshold. Um, how does that affect the data? For example, the a threshold is, is almost by definition kind of arbitrary, right? So what if you change that threshold and include or exclude more nodes? Does that change the results a lot, do you think, or have you tried? Um, so this has to do with um, the threshold for excluding nodes in the lesion participants? Yes. Not for the binarization of the connectivity values, just for the exclusion of nodes. Is that what? I thought that was, uh, um, so I, there's two I, I understood that we, you excluded nodes that didn't, or uh, uh, connections that didn't meet a certain threshold. If that's not true, then I was just wrong. In, in that case, the question shifts to how does the binarization affect the data? Well, well, sorry, I just did something that messed up something. Are, are we still, are you, st can you yeah. still hear me? Yeah, you're Okay. Still. Okay, I touched my computer and something happened. Let me, let me not do that. <laughs> um, so we, uh, so there's, so first of all, um, for the, the less interesting thing is that we, um, you know, there were 235 nodes that we were considering and each of these um, nodes is a little sphere that includes some number of voxels. I can't remember now exactly how many voxels are in each sphere. And so we, uh, if, a, if a patient had some proportion of those voxels, some threshold, I don't remember either the percentage, but maybe I think more than 25% of the voxels in a little sphere that were damaged, we just excluded that node altogether. So that was one thing that we did. Um, and I, but I don't think you, maybe you're, and that's, that's, that just eliminates that node from the analysis. And I don't know if you were asking about that. But the other thing that we did is for every pair of remaining nodes, we have a value for their connection or how correlated their activity is. Um, and there for everybody, the patients and the controls, in order just it's a data reduction you know, exercise, um, in order to sort of reduce the number of data points, we're just analyzing the connections that um, have the highest you know, connectivity value. So we have a threshold for keeping connections within the analysis. And so what we did there um, is we did look at, we, we redid the analysis with different kinds of thresholds for whether or not um, a connection is considered to be present or absent. Um, this was a, this, we use the same threshold for patients and controls, but we very, we, we did play around with using different thresholds for everybody. And we settled on the, we use a 40% a proportional threshold because it seemed, I mean, the all across all the thresholds, we're getting very similar results, and this was a very stable threshold across all the groups. So that's what we ended up using. So I know, I mean, you would you would mathematically get different results, but we haven't seen qualitatively different results with different thresholds. Yeah, that's clear. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe, if I may, one last question. That's more about the contents. I um, I was wondering if you had thoughts about how necessary the modularity needs to be specific to a particular function so that maybe there might be interventions that can improve overall modularity in patients that might affect various functions. Do you, is that the way you're yeah. going with your research? Or? I mean, I think that's a great question. So I, let me see if I, if I understood it. Um, I mean, what I understood I thought was a great question. So you're asking, could there be interventions that have um, broad impact on modularity that tend to just increase modularity across or in increase these levels of local integration, you know, across multiple modules in the brain? Right. And, yep. Yeah, and would those kinds of interventions, you know, be more beneficial than interventions that might be, you know, really targeting particular modules and increasing, you know, the, you know, the, the local integration for those modules? And I think that that 
would be a fantastic research question. Um, we, you know, we haven't embarked on that, um, but I think that these are the kinds of questions I'm excited by. You know, the, the, again, this is just dipping our toe into this. There's so much that can be done here, but I'm excited about the fact that this kind of work does raise these questions and does allow us to have ways of actually measuring that, right? We could have this idea that there's some intervention which we think, you know, should have this broad impact and the impact could either be, we might think that maybe it increases global connectivity or maybe we think that the impact is that it would, you know, increase, you know, local connectivity or so on and so forth. So we might have had these ideas in the past. I think people have had these ideas about different kinds of interventions, but now we actually have the tools um, to measure um, these characteristics of networks and really do the sort of an empirically guided approach to evaluating these, these questions. So I, I hope that people do follow up in these ways. Um, yeah, thanks. On that note, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, you're welcome. I wish I could see you. It's a little strange talking to my computer, but anyways, I hope it was okay. <laughs> no technical glitches. It was perfect. <laughs> I'll talk to okay, you later. Thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah. Bye-bye. And thanks to our online audience too. See you next time.